Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Uh, in this video, I was intending to shoot it exclusively and talk about airbrushing, and then all of a sudden I got a package in the mail today. I got a atomizer bottle. So we're going to revisit the Sophisticated Finishes product as part of this video. Uh, that way we can try the second round of experiments. A lot of people are commenting on that video. I'm impressed that every, the people who made it through made it through and it seemed like it was received well. So um, I'm happy to hear that because I did think it was a little bit long, but um, you know, I'm glad people felt like most of the things I, I mentioned in the video were worth listening to. So I appreciate that. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, we're going to do an application on the uh, building again. I'm going to um, spritzed it with the patina then while that sets up I'm gonna do a little weathering on the buildings and when I'm just about done with the weathering I'm gonna talk about airbrushing and then we're gonna come back and take a look at the sophisticated finishes uh, finish and see how that patina finished out um, and compare it to you know the effect I'd gotten before so um, first let's go in let's get this uh, chemical reaction going so we can take a look at it before the end of the night so um, before we revisit this building, just to give a hopefully a two second overview of um, what this is in case you missed the very first video. Uh, this is a sophisticated finishes. This is an antiquing solution. Uh, basically it's a metal impregnated acrylic paint and then an oxidizing solution that uh, brings out the patina in the metal. And there are a variety of colors um, and you can buy them at hobby stores and online at places like dickblick.com. Um, if you're interested in more details about the um, what not to do, most likely, you can go back and take a look at my previous video, um, which goes into this in much greater detail. But, um, looking at this building, um, you can see um, that it was very patchy. Now, I was thinking about taking a little synthetic steel wool and buffing this. Um, that is a, a way to uh, modify the effect, um, but I've decided rather than do that, that we will just paint right over this and go right in with the uh, patina solution right away um, since um, having um, oxidized material underneath shouldn't affect it um, except that it might affect its bond but we'll check that out and see um, I'm not afraid to do a little experimenting on this building um, and this is a good opportunity to do that so um, oh and I should say actually I was a little surprised but the uh, metal uh, the metallic surface finish, I think that's what they call it. Um, it does have a, uh, a rattle ball inside. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, so that's a good way to know whether your um, metal is uh, you know, settled or, or is it well mixed. You should at least hear that going, bouncing around. Oh, I need a brush. I didn't get set up for this. All right, and uh, before I get started on that, I'm gonna get my atomizer bottle uh, squared away here. Um, I'm pretty excited about this if this works because then I can just have a dedicated bottle uh, that is ready to go for this kind of project in the future. So, and it doesn't uh, cross-contaminate. There's no risk of me, you know, forgetting which brush I'm using or which bottle of, of water is the one I rinse, my cup of water I mean, is the one I rinse my metal brush out in or the one, you know, keeps it all squared away and tidy. Actually, I guess I should check and see if this is working. Let's try that first. Okay. Oh, and I think I'll be able to, uh, oh, I should, that's not in frame. This camera's in a different position today. Anyway, that's uh, pretty good coverage real quick there. So I'm not going to worry about getting it on the workspace here. So let's get this covered. I got other things to do tonight. I'm going to try and paint some miniatures. I don't do that very... That was way too much. That's a problem. Sometimes, um, because I need greater volumes, I uh, then, you know, typically, like, painting miniatures, I'm decanting, and I'm finding I'm decanting way more than I need. That's... Anyway. I'll come with time, I guess. All right. So let's just give this a quick coat. I'm going to put it on pretty heavy, try to keep it smooth, and I'm going to do what I did last time, which was go over it twice. Um, while I'm doing this, I should mention I got a video response from Brian Gregory. Now, I don't know if that shows up on the uh, video. Actually, I'm going to have to check um, to see if uh, I need to approve that or something. If so, I'll make sure that that gets up. But um, he, um, you know, was a really, uh, um, you know, 
what's the word I'm looking for, you know, really reflective on my video and um, had a lot of comments on it. So I recommend you check out his video um, to see some of his, uh, you know, feedback on sophisticated finishes. He had a couple statues that he had used them on, used these products on in the past. And it gives you a nice look at some alternative applications um, with some different kinds of finishes and also ones that um, have sat for a period of time. You know, some of those statues that he had covered, I believe he said had been done quite a while ago and had continued to oxidize over time, which is interesting, particularly if you don't seal it, as really, in essence, the normal weathering that's going to happen to these kinds of metals is still going to happen um, because if you don't seal it, you basically have exposed metal on the surface wherever the patina solution did not get. So that's something to consider. Um, you know, if you do a project with this and you don't seal it, which I kind of recommend you don't because it really changes that, that finish a lot, um, then you should expect your models to continue to evolve over time, which is, you know, I think kind of a neat uh, facet of it, but you may, you know, not like that as much. All right, we are just about covered. Oh man, that. All right, I'm gonna let that go. I, oh, that's gonna bother me. That little mistake there. I'm all in frame, right? I am. Okay. All right. So let's get this wrapped up here. I'm, uh, now, of course, you can still apply it while it's tacky, um, and uh, you know, some of this is going to be right on the edge of tacky. This is the sloppiest paint job I've ever done. Maybe I'll go back and uh, touch up some of those little mistakes with some gray. All right. Now, I think it's and. Actually, I just realized going around it twice really helps to ensure that I've gotten complete coverage. Now, that's not as big an issue with this piece because the underlying layer was so, you know, oxidized and darkened. But on a, on a fresh piece, um, where you're doing a second coat, because remember you need two coats at least, um, it'd be nice to make sure that you've got a complete coverage, uh, that you've got complete coverage, because it's, it is a little hard to tell. All right, so put my, uh... all right, here we go. And I am not going to be shy about how much I put on here. Oh, wow, do I like this better and um, I'm going to drip off a little bit this direction because I don't want it to really run down the model. You know, one of the things that somebody commented, another viewer um, commented on my videos, and frequently, folks, I forget your names, uh, and that is partly because you have crazy YouTube names and partly because I'm terrible with names. So please don't take offense. Hopefully you'll recognize when I comment on your comment that I did appreciate it. Um, but he was saying that... Um, metal uh, roofs like this when they oxidize, it's more a reaction with oxygen in the air, uh, reference to mixing it in earlier, um, and therefore you don't really get rivulets of the color coming down from the buildings. And that um, I should have uh, thought about more because I looked at probably 50 or 60 photos of green roof buildings and I never once saw staining on the walls and that should have been a giveaway. So, we really don't want this material, you know, carrying down the, the model, although it's pretty easy to clean off, especially the oxidized bits because it is just a powder. And uh, that is running. All right, I'm gonna let that run. I'm gonna just wipe it in. It doesn't seem, you can see, um, it doesn't seem to be corrosive to paint, at least to dried acrylic paint. So um, you don't have to worry, like sometimes when I do washes, um, with uh, weathering powders, I'll use alcohol as the carrier, and uh, because alcohol has a really low surface uh, uh, surface tension, so it really flows into cracks super, super well. But it, when it soaks into the paint, it will loosen up the acrylic paint. So you have to be really aware of that. So, all right. Um, and I had another person just before we leave this. Look at that. Can you see that? It's already darkening. All right. I had another person um, who sent me a video link that showed somebody spraying with a bottle. And they were doing a paper mache rabbit with the bronze color. Now, they were using a slightly different product. This was um, Tiffany Patina. There is a competing company that sells basically the same kit. Uh, but um, when she sprayed, she was going for a lighter effect. And you could see in the finished model the spots 
where the spray had gone. So that's a, a way you could control the effect. If you wanted a, a, a speckled pattern, you could lightly mist it from a distance and not soak it. But in this instance, I wanna see if we can get the maximum effect on this, and then areas I don't want it to be, I'm gonna try and buff it out, um, hopefully at the end of this video, so I can bring a little of that bronze back without, um, you know, in a controlled way, rather than having areas exposed that I didn't want exposed. So, we're gonna set that aside. I'm gonna do a little work here for a few minutes, and I'm gonna come back, we'll talk about airbrushes, and then we'll take a look at this. So I wanted to revisit airbrushing um, just a little bit. I seem to do this periodically uh, because as a few months go by, I discover something or learn something new or still have the same trouble and I figure, you know, it doesn't hurt to discuss it briefly. I know um, there's a lot of people out there who are getting into airbrushing. There are definitely a lot of people out there who are way better than me. So I'm not trying to say I'm anywhere. In fact, I, I think I'm terrible with an airbrush. <laughs> so you're basically getting the perspective of somebody who's trying to figure out how not to be terrible and how to avoid problems that really are discouraging from picking up an airbrush and practicing with it. Um, just before I get into the, the brush itself, just to show you, you know, I'm typically doing large scale areas. So, you know, and maybe I went a little crazy here, uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, darkening some large areas of the buildings, um, putting in, you know, very faint rain streaking, um, you know, some, some shading on the top. I'm not, you know, doing fine detail work. So with that said, I got a little list of uh, I got a list of things I wanted to talk about, um, share with you what I've been doing lately, and uh, hopefully some of this will be useful to a few of you out there. Um, first, I've been using up until this point I've been using pretty much um, Model Air by Vallejo, and um, I realized that in general, if I'm not painting miniatures, I only need a few colors, and I wanted to um, get them a little bit cheaper, and I also wanted to get some transparent paints. Now, I know Badger just came out with a whole line of airbrush paint, um, but that actually happened before I bought these. These are Createx uh, transparent paints, and they are basically, you know, in fact, you can kind of see me here test spraying a little bit on my palette. Um, you know, it's a, it's a transparent paint, you can get it opaque, um, and they have opaque versions, but, you know, it's something where I can shade areas, but still preserve some of the grays and the highlights that are beneath it, which is usually something I want to do with terrain. One of the big issues um, that is always a problem with airbrushes is keeping them clean, and what I ended up doing, whoops, let me get some tweezers here, lean in, don't look, all right, is that, um, I went back to using a screen. I have a bunch of um, copper screen that I had for, I don't know why, I, I've had it for years. It's kind of like the um, copper foil I showed in a previous video. And this is how I wash it. I just rinse it out in a big old cup of water. Um, but I found, even with um, some of the Vallejo airbrush paints, that what happens is they get a little um, chunky if you will, and sometimes those little chunks will fall into the bowl. I no longer mix paints in the bowl with a brush because I don't want to scrape any of the dried paint that's on the side of the brush because it'll clog the nozzle, especially if you're using a very fine graded nozzle like a, a 0.2 millimeter. We'll talk about nozzle sizes in just a second. Um, so what I've been doing to clean the brush, um, this has got my Createx paint left in it here. Um, I spray it out. In fact, I don't actually spray it out in my cleaning pot. I usually spray it out in the trash can right next to me. Um, but um, I spray it out. Whoops, I got to lean here one more time. And then I um, run a little uh, brush cleaner through it. I got Createx brush, brush cleaner. I'm also using, um, oh, this is actually Vallejo airbrush thinner. So I, I just mix and match products. Well, I try not to mix and match in the bowl that much, you know what I mean? Um, but I found actually the Vallejo thinner works great for the Createx paints and it works great for um, like GW paints as well. So that's a thought. Anyway, I don't put much in. I put a little bit in. And then one of the things that I've seen a lot of people do is they'll cover up the nozzle with a piece of paper towel or something to create a little back pressure so that you can bubble your uh, paint within the pot. I found a really easy way to do it. It took me a while to figure that out, just to discover it. But um, the paint pot has a vent where um, a little screen goes in, a little um, cloth screen to catch paint particles. But this makes a pretty good seal. I just put my thumb over it, and then I can just bubble back into the bowl as, you know, as strong as I want. 
then I'll blow a little out, then I'll bubble it back in a little bit, blow a little out, then I'll empty out the bowl. And the nice thing I like about that is the frothing bubbles, I mean, it's not clean at this point, but the frothing bubbles will bring up some of the airbrush cleaner into the bowl itself, um, which kind of will help to start loosening that paint. Then I'll go in with a piece of tissue or paper towel or whatever I happen to have on hand. I'll give it a good wipe out, not the song wipe out. And, um, Actually, looking in there now, it looks pretty clean. I'll run a little more um, airbrush cleaner in there. Let's just do that. And what I'll do, oh yeah, see when I put that in there, I don't know if you can see that, but that's uh, looking pretty milky black and, and chalky and, not chalky, but murky. Let's call it murky. So I'll do that process again. Oh, spray that out. I flush it a little bit, spray it out. And if I'm doing a real clean, sometimes that's all I'll do. I'll do that three times or four times, and then I'll put the brush away. I'm finding that not always a good idea, however. So if you saw my original video, if you're a longtime viewer of Terranscape's videos, you'll see me with my first airbrush going at it with acetone and cleaning the whole thing out. Um, I, I really don't get as persnickety about it because the more time you spend cleaning your airbrush, the more annoyed you are about it. <laughs> it's a big deterrent to using it. So at this point, I typically would go get a Q-tip. I don't have a Q-tip right next to me, and that one is not a lean over the table to grab, so I'm not going to do that. But when I'm going to do a full clean, I always push the needle out through the front. Um, because I figure if there's paint on the needle, I really don't want to drag it back into the housing of the uh, the airbrush. Now, there is um, seals within the airbrush. I didn't realize this until I watched a Badger video where he described um, airbrushes. And he said, never put a brush in your airbrush. He was very emphatic about it. Never, never, never. And I think that's how I ruined my old airbrush. Is I would get my little tiniest cleaner. Oh, I think I got him right here. Wait a minute. Another lean. There was a lot to prep for this part. And I didn't prep at all. Um, so, you know, you might buy these as airbrush cleaners, and I would take this, um, probably I think it was this one, and I would take it and I would go right in, right up into the middle of the, the thing, thinking I wanted to clean out that area since paint could get in there. That destroys the seal, and it really destroyed my airbrush because then paint would start backflowing into the brush and it started gumming up all the works, and it was a huge problem. So that's part of the reason why I went to the um, silver line here. Um, anyway, then I would um, take the uh, needle out and I would normally go in with a Q-tip with a little airbrush cleaner and wipe this out. I'm going to try to do this with a little paper towel just so I don't have to get up one more time. And uh, give that a quick wipe. Alright, we're going to count that as clean. If I ever need to get in there and clean it out more, I can, but it's not going to affect paint flow. And I'll wipe out the front of it as well. And I'll take a look inside just to see if there's any dried paint or anything weird going on in there. Looks pretty good. I'm going to count that as clean for today. Um, then I might uh, put a little cleaner on the uh, tissue. And uh, just give the needle a wipe down. Oh, you can see the tip is a little, a little bit more chunky. This is a 0.4 millimeter uh, needle size. Um, so it's a little bit more, nope, wait a minute, oh, I'm just curious if that tip was bent. Okay, looks good, I think it's the light. Um, then, um, you know, if I want to do a full clean, like I said, I don't always do that, um, then I'll put um, a drop or two of air in the, the not, ugh, a drop or two of cleaner in the nozzle. Um, now, what's interesting about the Evolution Silver line is um, the whole front end is uh, finger tight. I think I mentioned this in the previous video. It's also self-centering, so there are actually grooves cut into the needle tip here, into the nozzle. Let's see if I can show you that. So see those little, uh, there's like ribs in there. And those ribs um, hold the nozzle in place so that it can't wiggle in there. So it makes it self-centering and it, you're not likely to have a problem and then it's finger tight on and you just need to make sure this gasket is clean so it makes a good seal against the front inside in here otherwise you'll have paint leak into this interior which is not good for the brush and not good for you more cleanup time 
Anyway, so what I'll do is I will, this is the only way I've ever figured out to clean the nozzle tip. Well, that's actually pretty clean. Um, is to actually use the needle itself. And I will lightly, I try to be very gentle about it, scrape around the inside of the nozzle, see if I can feel any chunky paint, and then I'll push out whatever chunks I can find out the front end, pull those off, and actually this needle tip is pretty clean, so it's not too bad. Sometimes when I get a bad blockage, I mean, I'm, it's like pushing toothpaste out. Well, there is a little bit in there, though, which you probably can't see but you can understand it, especially if you do it yourself. All right, that's pretty much it. Now, as a last thought, oh, there we go. As a last thought on, um, sometimes I'll check the, the actual front of the nozzle opening here, um, but uh, that usually I just wipe off, that's not too bad. And if this, this uh, I don't know what this part is called. What is this part? You know, this is the cap that goes over the airbrush. Um, oh, I'm not doing a very good job of getting it in focus. There you go, you can see that. Um, I don't know what that's called, but sometimes paint will build up along the sides, in which case then I'll use a paintbrush with a little airbrush cleaner. I'm not going to do that right now, and I'd wipe that out. Okay, so when I assemble it, I always put the needle in the back of the airbrush, which is off screen. Anyway, I always put it in the back because I'm always going from back to front. That's, that's just the way I do it. Um, it seems like it's been keeping that seal in good shape. Um, then I, uh, whoops, set that aside, let me move this, hold on, hold on, this is, see, this is why I don't like doing this, plus this camera is right over my shoulder, and, uh, I feel really cramped in this table, so, this is why you're not, even though this is like back to back, you're not going to see these kinds of videos all the time. All right, so, um, then I'll, uh, screw on the front, push the needle through until it comes out, tighten that up, and it's clean. Now, if I wasn't doing this on camera... Um, it's it, probably about half the amount of time as I've done because I'm not gabbing when I do it. Okay, so having said all of that, I wanted to share with you a couple more experiences about my airbrush. One of the things that's a big problem is uh, tip drying, and you'll hear a lot of people talk about it. I got under the impression that if I bought a product that would help keep the tip dry, or uh, I'm sorry, keep the drying from happening, it would save me a lot of time. So I purchased Badger's Reg Dab. Get it? Badger backwards. They're clever, right? Anyway, Badger Red Dab, it's needle juice. And what you do is you um, put it um, a little bit on your needle. In fact, I'm going to show you how I was using it. I probably should. Um, this is the way, actually, I finally decided to use it because I think overall it probably improves the, the airbrush slightly. Um, I put a couple drops. Oh, it'll come out. There we go. I just put a little bit on the airbrush, and then I'll just coat it, just run it along the length. You'll feel it. It's like an oil. Um, it's probably it's probably glycerin that has been uh, priced up by a thousand percent. Feels like glycerin to me when I'm uh, touching it. Then I'll put that back in. Now that actually is a nice lubricant for the uh, seals inside and that's nice because then your your needles just really really smooth um, and it just I don't know it feels smoother when you're inserting it but the needle tip um, I find this does nothing for it in fact I've tried to make reapplications to the tip while I'm spraying and I find it almost does nothing to keep tip drying from happening so what was I doing instead I, I might have mentioned this in a previous video, and I'll tell you why I'm mentioning it again. Is I would keep a small brush, not that brush, but you know something like, uh, let's pretend this brush, something like this. I'd keep a little cap of um, uh, cleaning solution nearby, and every time the uh, tip would you know dry, I would just brush it off, spray, spray, and go back to spraying. Now I was keeping the needle cover off. That's what I'm going to call this, because getting in here is a little bit trickier. It's harder. I don't notice the tip drying because it's blocking my sight. And um, and it's just, you know, I can't just brush it off nice and easily. I have to kind of get in there and dig around a little bit. So I was spraying without this. Plus, you can get in closer, get the needle up closer, and you can get a finer line. So I was trying to practice with that. Well, what happens is, usually I flush out the bowl with a little water before I go into cleaning, and I dump it like this into a trash can nearby. And when I did that once, after doing it a thousand times, I hit the side of the trash can, 
and I bent the needle tip. And I bent it so badly that I think I bent the, ne the nozzle as well. Um, once I straightened the needle, resharpened it, I know it wasn't perfect, but it was, you know, pretty close. It was always spritzing off to one side, and I think I actually dented the needle nozzle. I, you know, it's so hard to see because they're so small. Um, I mean, when you're talking about 0.2 millimeter opening, if it's 0.205 off, that's a 5% error rate, but I'm not going to see five thousandths of an inch. So I went and I repurchased um, another 2 millimeter nozzle, uh, needle, and I repurchased um, a new nozzle for it. These two items were $38 shipped. That was kind of a costly mistake. So now I spray all the time with the, nozzle, the nozzle cap on just to protect the needle from getting hit. I don't know, it's a tip, uh, take it as, it, as you will. Um, I thought $38 for those two small parts was pretty expensive and I don't wanna spend that again. Let me take a look at my list. Um, oh, last thing for cleaning out. I um, did purchase a Sonic Cleaner. Sonic Cleaners, you know, it's like a box, about yay, about yay. You fill it with a water solution of some sort. You drop the whole thing all disassembled in there. You push the button, it vibrates for, you know, two minutes, whatever the timer is set at. And then you're supposed to pull out your, your uh, airbrush and it'll be sparkling clean and new. Um, I don't think it works. I don't understand Sonic uh, Cleaners. Um, I used a 50-50 mix of Windex and water, which was recommended to me, well, not to me personally, but I saw it as a recommendation on some other um, channel or something like that, and I think it did nothing, actually. Uh, it, a little bit of debris would come out, but I suspect it was more like loose stuff, loosely attached, but areas where, you know, there's paint dried on, it's not removing it. So my other thought was something maybe to try down the road is to buy an extra bottle of uh, airbrush cleaner and just fill up the uh, Sonic Cleaner with that and then run it. I don't know. I feel like I'm getting fine cleaning without the Sonic Cleaner, so my motivation to try that experiment is very low. Um, and uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that as a lot of people question Sonic uh, Cleaners, whether it's a worthwhile investment, and in my opinion, the answer is no. So. Um, once I have uh, done all that cleaning, I just slip this back in here and I push it aside and I'm done. So actually this is the next day. Um, I decided uh, after um, doing the application on the uh, roof that I wanted to let it sit and um, overnight and see if it developed any further. Uh, so let's take a look at the roof and then I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, more and then hopefully wrap this up. Uh, so, now, I'm not going to do a, a close-up over here because I'm trying to do this really quick this morning so I can get back to work, but I think, oh boy, that lighting looks terrible. Let's bring these, hey, lamp. Let's bring these lights in a little bit better so we can light it a little more evenly. All right. What happened is that it actually has a sort of uniform effect over the roof but the entire surface did not oxidize to a, I'm gonna bring it up here a little bit and see if that will uh, focus. Okay, I think you can see that. It did not oxidize the way I expected, which was to have the entire surface be the uh, vertigree, let's pull this back here, I think I'm blowing myself out. Uh, the entire surface be a vertigree color. So, I wasn't really sure why that happened, since I feel like I got a good even coverage. Um, then I had a suspicion. Here's a suspicion. Boy, and this is another long one. I'm not doing these for a while after this. All right. Um, mainly because the last video took 12 hours to upload on DSL. 12, and I had to do it twice. So, um, at the bottom of my spray bottle, and it may not pick up, but I noticed there is some sediment. I thought that perhaps uh, when I poured back some of the solution into the bottle that I had contaminated it with part of the metal surfacing paint and that perhaps that had reduced the pH uh, or reduced the amount of activator in the uh, patina solution and therefore maybe it's not as strong and that's why I got a partial effect on the roof. So what I did before the paint dried on my palette, I quickly did up another piece 
on a, whoa, here we go, on a piece of foam. I just painted it out real quick, dried it under a light real quick, probably wasn't completely dry, did a quick second coat, sprayed it down, and then left it flat. Um, so actually the patina solution was pooled on the surface a little bit and let that sit and look at the effect it gave. Look at that. That is, that is what I wanted on the roof. Look at that. That is, uh, it's got these really interesting greens and gradations in it. This is, that's what I wanted on the roof. Um, why it didn't get on the roof, I'm not entirely sure, but I do feel confident that my patina solution is still active and it shows that the um, spray bottle technique gives a nice uh, even coverage. So overall, I'm going to consider this experiment a success. I actually like this effect on the roof. I'm not going to do anything else with it. I think that actually came out pretty nice. Um, so I'm, I'm happy with the roof, but I still have to learn how to control the product a little bit more. All right, well, that's a revisit of sophisticated finishes as well as a revisit of the airbrush. Um, and maybe at the beginning of this video, I'll put back in some links that break up these sections so that people who are interested in one or the other can find those. Hopefully you found that helpful on the other video. I don't know, it's a little experimental. Um, so uh, I'll keep trying to um, help you navigate through these longer videos as uh, they develop over time, but they won't be that frequent as I mentioned. So um, keep your eye on the channel. I have a, a, a genuinely, genuinely quick video coming up uh, that I think everybody will probably be interested in. It will be released right after this one. So uh, keep your eye on the channel. Uh, I'll be back again real soon. And uh, once again, I do appreciate you taking the time to watch these and comment. Uh, it means a lot to me. So thanks.